Can you visualize an IP network? Do you see addresses and a subnet and a particular size of that subnet? We'll talk about those concepts and how you need to be ready to think about that as you plan your IP addressing scheme. So here's the context. Volume 1, Part 4, Chapter 11 has five sections. I'm ignoring the first one because it's really short. In the second section, there's a lot of content. So I made a different video for the first half of that. This video is about the second half of that, Part B, if you will. So in this Part B video, which is about addresses inside of a subnet, I've broken down the content as follows on the upper right of this slide how to visualize addresses in a subnet in the simplest of subnets. That is, the math is simple, so it's easy to conceptualize. We'll get into the math later. Then I want to talk about visualizing the size of a subnet and then talk about, well, what if you look at a bunch of subnets in their different sizes? So we'll talk about varied subnet sizes, a thing called VLSM. As always, I make some promises. And in this video, at the end, as always, we'll talk about what, if anything, to read in the matching book section. As always, I'll give you a review activity. And in this case, there's a cool command you can use to help verify some things with subnets. I'll point to that. All right, let's get into it. In this topic, I'm going to give you a couple of examples using subnets that have the simplest approach in simplest math, so much so that I can completely avoid telling you the math. All right. So in this design, I've got one VLAN on the left, so I need one subnet on the left, one VLAN on the right, so I need one subnet there, and one WAN link in the middle, so I need one subnet there. But I'm not going to bother talking about the WAN subnet in the middle. We'll just use as examples a subnet on the left and a subnet on the right. So let me show you some addresses. The PCs use those three addresses there, 10111, 10112, etc. And the router needs an IP address that's in the same subnet. Now I'm going to define to you how I know that's in the same subnet with this subnet ID and mass. All right. Similarly, we've got addresses over on the right, 1021, 10122, 10123 with the router with an address in this subnet with the logic that shows up in the yellow blob over on the right. So let's focus on the yellow blobs for a moment. In the left, the logic that's implied, now this is an important point, the logic that's implied by some math we can apply to this subnet ID of 10110 with this mask, which is the slash 24 part, equates to this. All the addresses must be in with three octets of 1011 and can range for anything in the fourth octet, anything that's legal. 1011 anything, if you will. And similarly, with this same simple mask, slash 24, but with this 10120 subnet ID, we take the 1012, all addresses begin with 1012, and then something between 0 and 255 for the numbers in the right hand subnet. So that's the simplest case. Now, subnetting is very flexible, which makes it more complex, and we haven't learned all the rules yet. But in this simplest case, that's how it works. So at least we can learn the simple cases quickly and easily. Now, by way of analogy, I talked about this in the related Part 2A video, if you will. In a US postal address, there are parts of the addresses in the same street that are the same and parts that are different from address to address to address, right? So if we've got this zip code or postal code in Nowhere, Ohio, that's the part that's the same for all addresses served by that post office, right? And then for all the addresses on the same street here on my favorite Cherry Cherry Street, the addresses, all the addresses for houses on that street have the same street. And of course, they have the same town, state, and postal code there. And this street is unique within this zip code. That is, there should be no other Cherry Cherry Street in the zip code. Otherwise, it'd confuse the postal workers when they're trying to deliver the mail. Now, that street address, the number, if you will, it's unique on the street. It's different from house to house to house so that we can tell the addresses apart. And that's kind of second nature if you live in the US or similar addressing schemes wherever you live. IP addressing has a very similar idea. There's a three-part view of the address structure. 
there's the network part that's defined by those original class A, B, and C rules. That's the part that's like a zip code. It's the same for all addresses in the network. Then there's the subnet part. That's the same for all addresses in the subnet, kind of like the street name, if you will. So everybody in the subnet has the same value in both the network and subnet parts of their addresses. And the thing that differs from address to address to address is called the host part. So it's like the street address or street number that's unique within the subnet. So we want to be able to think about addresses like that as a three-part address, knowing that it's the network and subnet part that's the same, like 1011 and 1012 in those examples a few moments ago. For example, up here, 10113, one of those addresses in the subnet on the left in that earlier diagram, it's got a network part. How do I know that? Well, from rules I haven't fully defined to you yet, but they have to do with class A rules, which class A says, hey, for all addresses that begin with 10, that's in a class A network, the network part in a class A address is one octet long, so that's a rule. Then for the subnet part, we can learn that from the rules about classes and masks. Again, I haven't defined it all to you yet, but I'm telling you the result right now is that beyond this first octet, we claim the second and third octets as the subnet part. And this mask then also tells us that there are one host octet. There is one host octet, and that's the part that has a value that's unique from address to address to address within the same subnet. So the same rule set that I told you before. Now, as you learn more about subnetting, we'll see the math that lets you figure all this out for any subnet, those that are more difficult to work with, or the simple cases that happen to use a slash 24 mask. Now let's transition and talk about all subnets of any size and type, even the more difficult cases, and talk about some general rules. First off, there's a subnet ID in every subnet, and there's a subnet broadcast address. They are the low and high number in the subnet range, and they're reserved. You cannot use them as addresses. However, there's a lowest usable address and highest usable address, and there's a relationship here. You can't use the subnet ID and subnet broadcast address as addresses, so one bigger is the lowest number address, and one smaller than the broadcast address is the highest usable address in a subnet. For instance, in that subnet in the upper left earlier, the subnet ID was 10110. You cannot assign it to a host. It's rejected. 10.11.255 also rejected because it's the subnet broadcast address. But one bigger, ending in dot one, can be used. And dot 254, which is one smaller than the broadcast address, can be used. It's the highest number. So anywhere in between here, from dot 1 through dot 254, can be used by hosts. So let's take one more example with the simple case of using a slash 24 mask. That is a mask with 24 1 bits in it, by the way. And in this case, we've assigned some addresses on the left. We've got this same mentality of the first three octets must be the same value. They all begin with 10, 2, 2. Then on the right, all the addresses begin with 10, 3, 3, as you see there. So that's the simplest case possible. If all you ever had was subnets with a slash 24 mask, we could, we could be done with the discussion about subnetting now. Turns out there are other possible masks, and those take a little more work. But that's all there would be to it. How big were those subnets we were just talking about? Well, it turns out there are 256 numbers in them, and two are reserved for 254 usable addresses. And there's some math that will tell us that. And that math is based on the mask. So that slash 24 mask means the mask, which is a 32-bit number that has 24 ones in it. By the way, in masks, in binary, the ones are always on the left. So there's your 24 ones on the left implying that the remaining bits are zero. So that's what we mean by slash 24 for a mask. 24 ones, the rest of the 32 bits are zero. So what does that mean? All right, what it means is that the prefix part, 
is the first 24 bits and the host part is the last 8 bits. Huh? So the prefix part, you might even guess this, it's the part that's the same value in all the addresses in the subnet. So the mask tells us about the addresses. It's not an address. It tells us about the addresses. Hey, all these addresses have the same value in the first 24 bits. In other words, the first three octets. And they differ in the last 8 bits. So if they differ in only 8 bits, how many things can you number with 8 bits? Well, it turns out you can number 2 to the 8 things with 8 bits. And that's how I know there are 256 numbers in a subnet with a slash 24 mask. So here's what I mean. So if I've got these eight zeros at the end of the mask, that means eight host bits. So H, or number of host bits, is eight. Two to the eighth is 256, I know from memory. But remember how we said the subnet ID and the subnet broadcast address cannot be used as addresses? So we subtract those out, and that gives us, drum roll please, the total count of 254 addresses available in those subnets. Now, you've already seen the pattern, right? And if you believed me and believed I wasn't lying to you, then you could see, yeah, that looks like 254 addresses. But that's the idea. In fact, let me remind you of it. In that upper left-hand subnet in the first example, the subnet ID was 10110, the subnet broadcast address was 101255, and all the numbers from 1 through 254 were the usable addresses, which, of course, there are 254 of these, the ones that have a last octet value of 1 through 254. So the size of the subnet, you can think of it as 2 to the number of host bits or 2 to the number of host bits minus 2 if you're subtracting out the reserved numbers at the high and low end of the subnet. The mask used in a subnet defines the size based on the number of host bits. So let's say you had a design like this and it turns out all these subnets use addresses that begin with 10 and it turns out all the addresses that begin with 10 are in the same class A network 10. And I haven't really defined that yet. That comes in the next chapter actually. So all these subnets though are subnets of class A network 10 as it turns out. So we've got this term at the top that's called variable length subnet masks. And that's a term that you have to interpret in the context of subnets of one class A, B, or C network. So in this case, we've got subnets of one class A network 10. So the question of does this design use variable length subnet masks, the question becomes does this design use more than one different mask? Is it one mask only or more than one mask? in the subnets of network 10 and the answer is no because all the masks are slash 24. Now what I did there was, to, was to define VLSM as a term just a bit but what's more important for us today here is that all these subnets are the same size because they use the same mask right we've already done the math just a few minutes ago conceptually then it's easier to work with because I can think of each of these subnets as being the same size, I can get used to that size, I can get used to the math, and it's easier to work with. People like working with just one mask. It's just easier. Now, a design that uses addresses in one class A, B, or C network, like this one, class A network 10, in this case, that uses more than one mask in those subnets, it's considered to be using variable length subnet masks. So the term really means using more than one mask in one class A, B, or C network. So in this case, notice slash 22, slash 30, slash 25, and so on. So yes, definitely more than one mask in these subnets in this design. So we're using VLSM. But the bigger deal to us right now is this. Those subnets have different sizes. It makes things a little more complex. So Give it a choice, use the simple way or the complex way. Uh, well, of course, you're gonna use the simple way if you can, but people do this. So what's the reason to choose to do it? Well, it's less wasteful. So if you've got a design where you think, you know, I need to conserve IP addresses, 
you right size the subnets. Maybe over here at this branch on the right, with this mask, you get two to the seventh minus two addresses. Maybe that's how many you need. This middle one, it's two to the fifth minus two addresses. Maybe that's what you need. Check this out. These WAN links, they're two to the second minus two big. In fact, let me show you the math. Two to the second minus two, or only two addresses on these WAN links. Does that work? Yes, because you only need an address on both sides of the WAN link for those WAN links. Here on this big subnet on the left, we'd have a little over a thousand addresses for that huge subnet. So you could right size the subnets and not be so wasteful if that's a bigger deal to you. Or you could use the same mask in every subnet and be simpler if that's more important in your design. To wrap up, we've been in Volume 1, Chapter 11, Section 2, the second half of that section. We're talking about analyzing IP addresses and subnetting needs. And you can skip that entire section in the book in this case and just take a break from the reading. Or you can read the whole thing. Now, why would you want to read it? There are some different examples in there. So if you're feeling like, hey, I could use a little more on this, just look for those different examples. But I covered all the topics, so to speak, in there. So speed along there if you'd like to. For review, I've got a video review, and what I've got in this review is I've got IP addressing schemes with broken addresses, rule breakers, if you will. So like over there on the left, 10111, 10112, like you've seen in a few examples so far. But over on the right, we've got this subnet that should be 1012 things, but notice this guy over here, 10999, obviously breaking some rules. All the examples use a slash 24 mask because that's all I've talked to you about so far. So what I want you to do is look for the rule breakers and make sure you've, you're clear on how to apply the rules for the simplest subnets, the ones with the slash 24 mask. So it's always better than not doing it to do it. So you could do it right now and that's great. But it's better if you'll wait a day or two and it's best if you'll schedule it to make sure you don't forget it. And the video's got a title like Subnet Practice IP Address Rule Breakers. All right, I promised a little extra in this case. Here's some cool commands that'll help you with kind of like testing out your IP addresses. Remember the two reserved cases in each subnet? Well, get yourself Cisco Packet Tracer or a real route or whatever and get into configuration mode and you can test out to see, hey, is this number a subnet ID or subnet broadcast address because you'll get this error message when you try to configure it. So here's the deal. You get into interface config mode, you type the IP address command, and you give it the address and the mask in dotted decimal format. And this is the subnet ID of that upper left subnet that we've used in several of the examples. 10110 followed by the mask of three 255s and a zero, which is the same mask as slash 24 just in dotted decimal notation. And when you've typed a number that's reserved, it doesn't say, oh, you've typed a number that's reserved, or oh, you've typed a subnet ID. It gives you this text, bad mask slash 24, slash 24, this mask, for address 10110, and then likewise, this one down here. All right, so if you want to test those out, bring up Packet Tracer, open up a router, get into interface config mode, configure some addresses, and see if they pass. If you configure one that's not a reserve value, like this one at the very bottom, you don't get the error message. I really enjoyed putting this pair of videos together. Thanks for hanging with me to the very end of it. If you're new, subscribe and click the bell. You know the drill on YouTube. As always, I'd much prefer to get a like and hear a comment from you and know what's on your mind. So please let me know what you're thinking about. Thanks a bunch. Later, y'all.